can have the answer to the question. Hello everyone, I'm Tali Carr. Welcome to the HBCU Game Day Fast Break. The regular season has ended, and of course it's always rivalry week as we head into the tournament, and last week, no different. One of the biggest rivalries in all of HBCU football, basketball, tennis, spades, you name it. North Carolina A&T versus North Carolina Central. For some reason this week, eh, they, they scheduled the game for spring break. Affected the crowd a bit, but not the feelings at all. Wally Pitt, Stephen J. Gaither, our crew was there, and they have more. All right, Tyler, what's up? It's SJG, Wally, yes, and sir. we are in the place to be, and that is A-G-G-I-E-L-A-N-D. Okay, you, cover, you, yeah, you brought it back. Anyway, we're at Corporate Sports Center, uh, where North Carolina a t just finished up another season of college basketball, and it's been a pretty good one for the Aggies. Yeah, man, regular season is over. Aggies finishing it up in second place. Uh, I think one thing they're real happy about is they dusted them Eagles off real real proper like this year. 12-piece uh, wing combo, all the bird, fried bird references you want. Let's go ahead and check out the highlights before we get into the MEAC tournament. It's the final game of the MEAC regular season, and I'm making my first visit to Club Corbett in Greensboro, North Carolina for round two of the Aggies eagle hoops classic the students were on spring break but it was 7 30 and the club was jumping jumping and so were the aggies in the layup line the bounce is real over here in the borough and i think hbcu jam alum ronald jackson and this 360 windmill was easily the winner for me tonight Now the Eagles said y'all got pregame dunks, that's cool and all that, but Jabri Blunt got one that counts. A nice jam off the inbound from Mr. Blunt. But my dun dun Ron Jackson was looking to catch a body on the baseline with this big dunk. Aggies up early, but NCCU was able to put together a little run capped off by this Zakari Douglas 3 that gave them the 2019 lead. Blunt finishes the quarter with 10 points. Zakari Douglas chipped in eight of his own. But a t got eight points each from Cam Langley and Amari Hamilton, plus five offensive boards from Big Ron Jackson, and the Aggies took a 31-27 lead in the halftime. Now they call it Club Corbett, but it felt more like a block party once Ibrahim Salah was on the floor. He wipes this Jordan Perkins layup off the glass and Quad Copeland takes it rim to rim for the lay and one. The Aggies still over the stove whipping the work. Quad Copeland with the assist this time, he finds Tyrell Lyons for the sweet up and under lay in. The Aggies starting to pull away. Cam Langley gets all types of horizontal with this tough bucket in the paint. He finished the night with 17 points. Amari Hamilton with the deep three-pointer. Mr. a t Tariq Cohen has the tray up after that one. Hamilton had 12 of them things for a t in this one. The only real bright spot for the Eagles in the second half was Rasheen Davis who had 11 points, including this big boy jam off the inbound. But the real star of the half was a t's Malik Gans. He went six for six with 12 points and it was fresh lay after fresh lay after fresh lay. This one here was an and one. And had he caught and boomed this one like he wanted to, I probably would have just took my camera and went home. Aggies in full control late in the game, up 18 after the Gantz alley tip, and it only got worse for the Eagles. Quad Copeland with another nice lay-in. Ibrahim Salah letting us know the block party still popping after the club lets out. He even had Tariq out here giving them a tumbo finger wag. North Carolina a t gets the 74-52 win over NCCU, a season sweep of their rivals from Durham. And let's just say after the game, a t's Malik Gantz had something to say for y'all out there in Game Day Nation. Hey, shout out to HBCU Game Day. We won undefeated at the crib, man. Shout out to y'all. 
So there you have it. Those are the highlights from round two of the Aggie Eagle. Not so classic this year. a and taking it home. Now, Club Corp is usually popping, but it was grown and sexy night tonight. The students are on spring break. The OGs were in here. What'd you say, Steven? It was, it was more whispers than Migos. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, so like we said, a and number two team in the MEAC. Steve, what you looking forward to on this tournament? Uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to seeing if uh, you know Norfolk, uh, they always have the pressure of being the home team this year. They have the added pressure of being the number one team. Um, they have, uh, you know, dominated the MEAC so far, um, including a and in, in Norfolk a couple weeks ago. So, you know, it's always good for the MEAC now with it being in Norfolk, if Norfolk State at least makes it to Friday so they can make some money. So we'll see how that happens. It should happen this time, but you know, the MEAC tournament is known for upsets. So, you know, you never really know how it's going to go. Could very well be North Carolina a and You see all those banners? You guys can see them right. All those banners back behind us, there's a lot of them. But there's only been one in the last 20 years, and that was 2013. And nobody expected the Aggies to get it that year. So uh, it could be a situation again where somebody else creeps up as a dog. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to be, you know, I'm the wild prediction, man. I'm stepping out on the limb this year. South Carolina State. Not a great record, but they've lost all their games by these in margins. And I mean, if South Carolina State puts together a run or two, they, they might be in that thing. It's a it's a wildly a wild wildly prediction, but look out for South Carolina State. But um, is it going to be the top tier of the MEAC, or you think there's going to be a sleeper to creep in? Well, I think Bethune Cookman is playing really good basketball right now. Um, you know, they're projected to be number one. They lost uh, Isaiah Bailey uh, early in the year, and that kind of hampered them. But they've been on a roll since then. They got my man Hope. The, uh, AKA the Moses Malone of the MEAC. So we'll see if they can uh, put the run, have the, a run in Norfolk, if they can fight uh, fight everybody else is gonna be on there. The refs, I don't know, but we'll see. Uh, fight. Shots fired. Yeah, yeah, and, and talk, speaking of Howard, fight, there's Howard. Um, if they can find some D and not be Howard, then maybe they can uh, sneak up and be there too. So, um, you know, we know who won't be there, this fam you. That hey, th things happen, so, and it's it's sad for FAMU because they were putting together a little run, and ever since it was announced that they weren't going to be in the post team postseason, they've kind of LeBron Lakers did it. It's, it's just like it's when they did that uh, when they did that Gatorade dunk when you are down at the field and they missed it. And ever since then, it went downhill. So. Oh. Hey, that's that's Steve, not me. When you see me, baby, I I, I want no to, beef. Shout out to my man Curtis <laughs> Ford, a big a, a big fan, a game day supporter, fan you alumnus. But no, it's um yeah. So anybody can win, just like before, you know. So we'll see what happens. Even Coppin State, you know, Coppin yeah. State is, you know, they were you know a slap horse for you know so long, and they've come and they've hurt some feelings. They beat North Carolina Central, and we have talking about Central, uh, and that's because they kind of. They're, 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 they're not coming in this tournament with the best bounce, but, you know, um, you think happen in the tournament, Coach Bolton knows how to win, and uh, those guys will be playing their best ball in Norfolk next week. Yeah, we've seen Coach Bolton put together too many runs for us to count them out. But, yeah, I think it's, man, it's going to be anybody's ball game. Whoever gets hot, whoever plays well. And, I mean, just like we've been saying about a and I'm sticking to my analogy. a and they like jagged edge, man. And nobody going solo, but they keep coming with the hits. And I mean, it's gonna be hard for anybody to be a and or Norfolk. Like you said, Cleet Cheryl Pope, my man Wally, the other Wally from Bethune, shout out to him. Um, I'm excited for it. I know Steve's excited for it. It's gonna be my first trip to the scope. We're gonna kick it back down to Tali. He's gonna be at the SWAC tournament this week, and we're gonna see what he's got popping in Atlanta. So the MEAC is a wrap for the regular season. Same thing for the SWAC. They begin their conference tournaments this week. The MEAC in Norfolk, over in the SWAC, they do it a little bit differently. They have satellite games in the opening rounds, and then for the semifinal and the finals, they will be in Birmingham, Alabama. Let's take a look at the seedings, the matchups, and the brackets. MEAC tournament kicks off in Norfolk this weekend. Let's start with the ladies. First game of the week, Howard, number five, taking on FAMU. Number six, Morgan State will follow that up with the game against Coppin State, on the ladies' side. Then on Tuesday, we got Delaware State playing North Carolina Central in an 8-9 matchup. That should be interesting. And then we've got South Carolina State taking on Savannah State. Could be Savannah State's last game as a member of the MEAC in women's basketball. We'll see. Then we get to Wednesday. Things get interesting. So the winner of that Delaware State-North Carolina Central game, they get a matchup with North Carolina A&T, who has not lost a MEAC game since before last year's tournament. So tough task for whoever it is. Hey, we could get Aggie Eagle Part 3. Maryland Eastern Shore takes the court as well on Wednesday night. They'll play the winner of number 7 versus number 10, 
South Carolina State versus Savannah State. And then Thursday, finally, Norfolk State, the women's team, home team, will get a chance to finally step on the court. And number three, BCU. BCU is usually a contender in this tournament. Don't be surprised if they sneak up and are still playing come Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Over on the men's side of things, once again, we got a funky format because, again, Florida A&M is not eligible for this tournament. So uh, they kick things off for number six, Savannah State, looking to keep its MEAC history alive for a little bit longer. They'll take on Delaware State on Monday night in the first game of men action. On Tuesday, we've got Maryland Eastern Shore taking on South Carolina State. And, wow, we get the Battle of Baltimore Part 3. Coppin State has swept Morgan State during the regular season. Can Juan Dixon's team do it again and send Todd Bozeman's team home early on Tuesday? Man, there was a while there you could just pencil Morgan State to be in the championship game for a while. They were in the championship game, I think, five years in a row, something like that. Uh, times have changed. Wednesday, it starts to get real. You've got Norfolk State, the home team, the number one team, will take on the winner of Maryland Eastern Shore and South Carolina State. South Carolina State, for a number nine seed, they could be really scary in this tournament, let me tell you. But for Norfolk State, uh, it is a huge tournament for them. They're number one. They've had the best year in the MEAC. Uh, and the MEAC depends heavily on them to get butts in the seats because they are the home team. They do have a rather large following. Uh, if Norfolk State is to, to stay in this tournament through Saturday, things will probably be pretty good for the MEAC at the box office. If not, things could get pretty light. So we'll see if uh, Coach Jones and his team can hold on to the mantle of number one. Underneath them, you've got North Carolina a and They don't have any superstars. They didn't get any players on any MEAC honors. They just got the second uh, best record in the MEAC, and they have a guard in Cam Langley that I think is really uh, one of the better guards in the MEAC. So you're going to definitely want to check out for him. They'll be playing the Coppin State, Morgan State winner, trying to uh, advance to the semifinals as they uh, contend as they will get the bye if they win. The winner of this game won't have to play until Friday. Thursday, we've got some pretty intriguing matchups, one that we know for sure right now, and that is number five, Bethune-Cookman, and number four, Howard. Let me tell you why. Bethune-Cookman was predicted to win the MEAC. They had a lot of guys coming back, really talented guys, had some injuries early, and they ended up with the fifth spot. But they've got my man, Cottrell Pope, the Moses Malone of the MEAC down there getting boards. They got some talented scorers, so they're a team to watch. And then you've got Howard. Howard, you could call them Howard because they don't play any D. But they did pick up a win in Norfolk the other day to, as R.J. Cole, the MEAC offensive player, the MEAC player of the year, uh, was able to uh, put up 36 points in the win. And they've got one of my favorite players in the MEAC in C.J. Williams running him as wingman. They, are, they can really score the ball. The question is, can they play enough defense to keep things going? So that'll be an intriguing matchup. And then uh, we've got North Carolina Central, number three, in the seedings, the defending MEAC champs, man, they took it to the chin the other night against North Carolina A&T. They'll get the winner of Savannah State. Delaware State, mm, they, even though they got number three, they might have the easiest, if you want to say that, they might have the easiest route of the top four teams. Um, but we'll see what happens. Anything can happen. It, it's been a crazy year in the MEAC, uh, and the MEAC tournament is traditionally topsy-turvy. If you check out the article we wrote on Howard, you'll see how the number one seed has only won this tournament five out of the last 12 times. So will we continue to see that trend or will the number one team, the uh, box office, uh, the box office bonanza come in? We'll see. It should be fun. Myself, Wiley, and even Steven Season and my man Michael Pill will be there as well. So we'll have lots of coverage from Norfolk enjoy and be sure to subscribe for additional content that nobody else is going to see but just our subscribers okay so in the swag only the top eight teams make the tournament here they are southern will host mississippi valley state southern is the champions of the regular season they clinched that by beating prairie view who is number two and they will host alabama a and m and between that grambling, four and the five, so Shekyla Hill will take on Texas Southern as they try to repeat as SWAC tournament champions. And then in the last quarterfinal, you've got Jackson State hosting Alabama State. All right, so the winners from that go on to Birmingham. 
on Friday. You've got the winner of Game 1, Southern versus Mississippi Valley State, taking on the winner of Gramley State and Texas Southern. So we could get Southern versus Gramley State Part 3. Oh, boy. And then the winner of Prairie View A&M and Alabama A&M will face Jackson State and Alabama State winner. The championship game will be on Saturday, and the winner goes to the NCAA tournament. Let's go over to the fellas. Same format here. Number one, coming out of Texas is no surprise. Prairie View A&M, though, gets it over Texas Southern. Nobody would have thought that coming into the SWAC regular season, but that is why you play the game. PV A&M, they will host Alcorn State. Last year, Gremlin didn't get a chance to play in the postseason despite winning the regular season championship, but they're in it now. They are a number four seed, and they will be hosting UAPB. Texas Southern, remember these guys who won three games against P5 competition early in the year? Well, they couldn't quite catch up with Prairie View, so they're in the number two seed, and they will face off against Southern. And you know what? Southern just beat them the other day. Good luck doing that again, though. All right, so here we go on the other, the last men's quarterfinal. We've got Jackson State, number three, versus Alabama State. So the same matchup on the women's side, we will get on the men's side. That'll be interesting. So the winner of Prairie View A&M, Alcorn State, will take on the Grambling State UAPB winner in one semifinal on Friday. The other semifinal will be Texas Southern versus Southern, winner versus Jackson State versus Alabama State. Very interesting. And again, the championship is at 5 p.m. on Saturday. Tally Carr will be there. Our man Wilton will be there. And you won't want to be anywhere else but HBCU game day for all of your best SWAC tournament coverage. So our Division II brethren and sisters wrapped up their tournaments last week in the CIAA and the SIAC. But some big news. We'll, we'll get to the brackets in a minute. But some big news came out of the CIAA after the tournament. Amir Hinton from Shaw University, the Philadelphia kid. He was only a bear for one season. He lit the league and the NCAA on fire. He was the leading scorer in the entire country. Well, he announced he's a bear no more. Foregoing his last year, he has declared for the NBA draft. But he left us with a gem in Charlotte. Before he left, a matchup against St. Aug, the crosstown rival. They did it this time in Charlotte. He matched up mano a mano against Tyree Gaithright, and man, it was one to remember. Quarterfinal action in the CIAA tournament pitted both squads from the 919 against one another as Shaw faced off against St. Aug to see which Raleigh NC squad would survive and advance to the semifinal round at the Spectrum Center and the fans at the Bojangles Arena were treated to a fantastic one-on-one -on -one matchup as St. Augustine's senior and third leading scorer in the CIAA, Tyree Gaithright, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with CIAA Player of the Year and leading scorer, Philadelphia's own Amir Henton. Both players were all CIAA backcourt selections and they guarded one another for the bulk of the contest, but the first half was all Tyree Gaithright. He went five for seven from the field, hit three or four from beyond the yard, finished the first half with 13 points, all while holding Amir in check as Hinton went one for six from the field and finished the half with his team down by as many points as he managed to score, five. But as the second half got going, Amir turns up on D, getting big steals and even a nice block and recover on Gaithright right here. Plus, he started to find his stroke from three. But Tyree kept the pedal to the floor, managing to score past some tough Amir Hinton D. And getting the bucket plus one on this crazy lay where it looks like he jumps clear over Derek Randolph. Gaithright was scoring in traffic, and his team was up by eight with around eight minutes left to play, and he and Amir Hinton were trading big buckets all half long. But Amir Hinton is the CIAA Player of the Year for good reason, and it was right around the time he got this steal and slam that he began to show why he's a cut above the rest talent-wise. 
Amir skies over Tyree for the big rebound. Gets the ball back at the top of the key where he gets a Euro step left-handed and one that brings Shaw within three points. Then Amir goes baseline. Up and under, count the basket with another three-point play opportunity. It's now 52-50 and St. Aug is clinging onto their lead with four and a half left to go. Then, Amir Hinton activates his beast mode, the big offensive board, the grown man bucket in the paint, and the game is tied up at 52 all. Gaithright looking to make a big play on the other end, but he's called for a push off. Shaw gets some big buckets down the stretch, and Amir hits some free throws to seal it, and the Shaw U Bears get the 62 55 win. Tyree Gaithright scores 23. Amir Hinton scores 26 and is the game's MVP. And after his third matchup against Tyree Gaithright and the St. Augustine's Falcons, Amir talked about the adjustments he had to make to the new look D that the Falcons threw his way. They started the game off um, playing me a little different. Um, two guys, they kind of ice, ice the screens and they kind of try to force, force me to go um, baseline or, or they try to trap me more this game uh, post to, um, before when we played them. So after halftime, I had to make some adjustments to be more aggressive. Uh, my coach told me to be more aggressive, and um, that's that's all. That's what I had to do. So we have conference champions in the CIAA and the SIAC. Now, the pursuit of a national championship begins. We have five HBCUs who are in the postseason running out of the CIAA on the women's side. We have Virginia Union and Bowie State. Now, Virginia Union was ranked number one in the region up until the final poll, which decides the seedings for the NCAA tournament. And it, a little seedy, I would say. They go from number one to number two. You need to write your local NCAA vote guy or girl, and let's figure out how that happened. But anyway, they are in, along with Bowie State on the women's side, and out of the SIAC lane, the upset Cinderella champions, they are in the postseason as well. Benedict was a number eight seed in the region last week. They did not make it in. On the men's side, only the champs make it here. No at-large bids. We have Virginia State out of the CIAA and Miles College out of the SIAC. Both teams on the road, but hope and dreams are alive for a national championship. We wish all of those guys and girls all of the best in the NCAA tournament. Well, that's it for the regular season edition of the Fast Break. We'll have plenty of conference tournaments and NCAA action to talk about next week. So you guys enjoy your week. And as always, stick with us for all of the updates out of the MEAC the SWAC, and the NCAAs. Man, thank you so much to our supporters. We do this because of you, and we do it for you. Many of you have become subscribers on our Facebook page. You are now fan funders. We appreciate that. It's only $4.99 per month. You can cancel at any time. Your financial contribution goes a long way and us providing the best HBCU coverage that we possibly can. If you'd like to become a fan subscriber on Facebook, no strings attached, just take it for a ride. You can go to our Facebook page. There's a subscriber button that you can click on. It's also at the bottom of many of our posts, so you can check it out there. If you'd like to make a one-time or reoccurring donation larger than $4.99, hey, that makes us happy too. Just go to our website hbcugameday.com backslash donate. We have several different ways where you can become a contributor there as well. Look, guys, we can't do it without you. We're doing it for you. Thank you so much for your support. Have a great week. Exciting times as the tournaments roll on. Stick with us on social media and at hbcugameday.com. Thank you again. I'm Tali Carr. The rest of the crew says, what's up? See you later. Have a great week, everyone.